The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this fourth webinar on the Secret Teachings of All Ages by Manly P. Hall. This and all subsequent webinars will be available on makara.us. Just click on the MF webinar heading and you'll find the Secret Teachings link under its own subheading as shown here. Today we'll be following the esoteric thread through the European philosophers. We finished up last month with a brief look at each of the Neoplatonist philosophers, which included Iamblichus, thought by many theosophists to be an earlier incarnation of the master Hilarion. The writings of each of these great men take us deep into the ancient wisdom teachings. Uh, we read excerpts from each of them last month. The Neoplatonists, along with the earlier Gnostics, were the last schools whose prominent members were, in my humble opinion, overshadowed by a direct knowledge of the ageless wisdom, either through an avatar or a master of wisdom. We also took a look at the mythological tree formulated by one of these Neoplatonists, the last of them really, Proclus. But we'll now turn back a page to continue with our reading, which summarizes Neoplatonism, which just happened. Sorry. Okay. Okay, now let me go back in. There we go. Okay, never had that happen before. Anyway, so could we um, get a reader for this section? It's always when you're reading, always skip the grade part and go to the uh, dark part. Okay. Please go ahead, Walter. I assume that's why your hand is up. Thank you. Oh, yes, indeed. When the physical body of pagan thought collapsed, an attempt was made to resurrect the form by instilling new life into it by the unveiling of its mystical truths. This effort apparently was barren of results. Despite the antagonism, however, between pristine Christianity and Neoplatonism, many basic tenets of the latter were accepted by the former and woven into the fabric of patristic philosophy. Briefly described, ne Neoplatonism is a philosophic code which conceives every physical or concrete body of doctrine to be merely the shell of a spiritual verity which may be discovered through meditation and certain exercises of a mystic nature. In comparison to the esoteric spiritual truths which they contain, the corporeal bodies of religion and philosophy were considered relatively of little value. Likewise, no emphasis was placed upon the material sciences. So any thoughts or questions? The, uh, the term shell of a spiritual verity well describes the form aspect. So here's the side of Plato's Academy in Athens, the inspiration for the Neoplatonist school. It's amazing to me that it still exists and they've been able to identify it. Um, okay, let's skip down to MPH's passing reference to the Gnostics. Can we get a, um, a reader for this short paragraph? Leia, can you read that for us, please? Sure. Uh, Gnosticism, system of emanationism and interpreting Christianity in terms of Greek, Egyptian and Persian metaphysics appeared in the latter part of the first century of the Christian era. Practically all the information extant regarding the Gnostics and their doctrines stigmatized as heresy by the anti-Nicene church fathers is derived from the accusations made against them, particularly from the writings of St. Irenaeus. Thank you, Leah. <clears throat> um, could we get a reader for 
this definition of emanationism. Oh my goodness. Are you seeing a black screen now? Yes. Okay. Uh, I might have to go out of full screen mode here. Let me see if I can get back in. See if that happens regularly. I'll have to come out of this mode. Okay. Uh, if we could get a reader for this, please. Okay, hold on a second here. I thought, there we go. All right. Um, Cindy, can you read that for us, please? You're self-muted. There you go. Um, I have laryngitis. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no <Getting> problem. <laughs> Jeremy, can you read that for us, please? Yes. Emanationism. All things are derived from the first reality or perfect God by steps of degradation to lesser degrees of the first reality or God. And at every step, the emanating beings are less pure, less perfect, less divine. Emanationism is a transcendent principle from which everything is derived and is opposed to both creationism wherein the universe is created by a sentient God who is separate from creation, and materialism, which posits no underlying subjective and our ontological nature behind phenomena being imminent. We believe in a universal divine principle, the root of all from which all proceeds, and within which all shall be at the end of the great cycle of be. Key to philosophy. Thank you. Okay, so you know we can see the the um, ageless wisdom in this. Uh, yeah. um, so Gnosticism means having knowledge. Uh, which was arguably the most effective marriage of Christianity and the ageless wisdom teachings until the advent of theosophy. Their beliefs included the idea that the material world was created by a lower God or demiurge, thus trapping the divine spark within the human body. This divine spark could be liberated by gnosis, spiritual knowledge, acquired through direct experience. Uh, could we, here, I'll read this um, description of the image here. It's an image of the Abraxas stone or gem from the Gnostics and the remains by Charles W. King. Um, and the letters are e, e -I -A -O, Y-A-O, um, uh, which means eternal sand the eternal sun. Um, so we have an, an alpha omega and uh, the eternal sun uh, built into this image. So can we get a reader for this definition, four point definition of Gnosticism, please? Lynn, can you read that for us, please? Yes. One, there is an unknowable God who gave rise to many lesser spirit beings called eons. Two, the creator of the material universe is not the supreme God, but an inferior spirit called by them the demiurge. Three, Gnosticism does not deal with sin, only ignorance. Four, to achieve salvation, one needs Gnosis, knowledge. Okay, thank you. In 1945, a leather-bound collection of Gnostic texts was found in a large sealed jar near the town of Nag Hammadi, Egypt. Among these writings was a text entitled simply The Gospel of Truth. Here are some excerpts that might help give us a taste of the esoteric teachings of Gnosticism, whose doctrine was almost completely lost until this uh, momentous discovery. So could we get a reader for this, please? Uh, yes, one of the many Marthas we have with us today. Uh, Martha G., can you read that for us, please? Yes, yes. Fragment F of the Gospel of Truth 
describes the Gnostic congregation as children of eternal life and hopes that they will nullify the world without themselves being nullified and nullify the realm of appearance, the realm of existence that lacks the Father. The text goes on to describe how fear and the lack of knowledge are connected. Having entered into the empty territory of fears, he, Jesus, being both knowledge and perfection, passed before those who were stripped by forgetfulness, proclaiming the things that are in the heart of the Father, so that he became the wisdom of those who have received instruction. Fear is not real because it does not come from the Father. That which is not light is not from the Father, such as a tree only brings forth one fruit. The Father's only fruit is light. Thank you, Martha. Uh, so as mentioned before, Gnosticism and Neoplatonism were the last of the great schools of philosophy until the enlightenment of the 17th and 18th centuries. But there were a number of individual philosophers that stood out through the next dozen or so centuries, though in many cases they had to brave an inflexible church doctrine risk being declared a heretic, as were the Gnostics, and even risk death at the hands of the Inquisition. So could we get a reader for this paragraph, please? Carrie, can you read that for us, please? Okay. The death of Boethius in the sixth century mark the close of the ancient Greek school of philosophy. <clears throat> the ninth century saw the rise of the new school of scholasticism, which sought to reconcile philosophy with theology. Representative of the main divisions of the scholastic school were the eclecticism of John of Salisbury, the mysticism of Bernard of Clairvaux, and Saint Bonaventura, the rationalism of Peter Abelard and the pantheistic mysticism of Meister Eckhart. Among the Arabian Aristotelians were Avicenna and Averroes. The zenith of scholasticism was reached with the advent of Albertus Magnus and his illustrious disciple, St. Thomas Aquinas. Thomism, the philosophy of St. Thomas Aquinas, sometimes referred to as the Christian Aristotle, sought to reconcile the various factions of the scholastic school. Thomism was basically Aristotelian with the added concept that faith is a projection of reason. Thank you, Gary. So let's take a look at a few of the thinkers mentioned here. Uh, in addition to um, being the most influential of the pre-modern era of philosophers, the, the late Neoplatonist Avicenna, or Avicenna, is considered to be the father of modern medicine after compiling a five-volume encyclopedia on the subject, which became a standard medical text at many medieval university universities. Uh, for as late uh, as 1650. He had a tremendous influence on medicine uh, all during the what are called the Dark Ages. Uh, but he also was a, um, uh, a very astute late Neoplatonist. Uh, could we get a reader for this uh, brief quote from uh, Avicenna? Nicholas, can you read that for us, please? Read that for us, please. Okay, let's try. Michael, can you read that for us? You're self muted. Yeah, okay. sure. There you go. Thank you. Our God, the Supreme Being, is neither circumscribed by space nor touched by time. He cannot be found in a particular direction, 
and his essence cannot change. The secret conversation is thus entirely spiritual. It is a direct encounter between God and the soul, abstracted from all material constraints. Thank you, Michael. So, you know, uh, I don't know about you, but it's for me very heartening to see how the ancient, the ageless wisdom uh, was held and reinvented, you know, throughout the centuries. So, you know, we're used to whatever our source is, you know, for many of us, it's um, Alice Bailey and DK, and, um, and you can become kind of single pointed in your awareness of, of where these, uh, the sageless wisdom comes from, but you can find it through, you know, and it, to me, that's what's exciting about this particular review that MPH is involved in. You can find it, you know, stretching back through the centuries and it, it you can always recognize it, you know, for instance, in this quote, you know, that there was a connection with um, the, some form of source teaching in these, in these uh, great philosophers. So uh, let's see here. Um, Meister Eckhart uh, is next up. His sermons almost always focused on the presence of God through one's soul and the dignity of the soul of the just man. In the sermon quoted here, we see the influence of the ageless wisdom. Could we get a reader for this brief quote? Uh, Lona, can you read that for us, please? Go back to a human being has so many skins inside, covering the depth of the heart. We know so many things, but we don't know ourselves. Why 30 or 40 skins of heights as uh, sick and hard as an ox or bears cover the soul? Go into your own ground and learn to know yourself there. Thank you. You know, so we see the echo of, of, of know thyself, which was on the lentil of Plato's academy, right? And very possibly was taught to him originally by Pythagoras um, through Socrates. Uh, Albert Magnus, his writings, all 38 volumes worth, revealed his encyclopedic knowledge of dozens of topics from logic to theology, from astronomy to astrology, always with an esoteric orientation. In addition, he interpreted and systematized the whole of Aristotle's works, gleaned from the Latin translations and notes of the Arabian commentators. In fact, most modern knowledge of Aristotle would, would probably have been lost if it weren't for Albertus's writings. Next up, St. Thomas Aquinas was probably the most influential writer of his time, but though he championed Aristotle, he was first and foremost a theologian. Here he is shown triumphing over Averroes, a Muslim philosopher who ironically also championed Aristotle. You can see Averroes crouching at the bottom of the painting. Such was the exclusive nature of the church. So before we go back to the text, let's take a look at the illustration on page 17 there to your right. Um, can we get a reader for this? I'm gonna to try to go back into this mode. Sorry about this folks, I'm trying to figure out what's wrong here. Let me see if I can turn off another program. Um, my little limited computer here um i'm gonna uh martha you have your hand up are you volunteering to read you're self-muted i i just wanted to offer if i could um that picture of of thomas aquinas with averroes almost under his feet has to reflect really the church's attitude because in the summa Thomas Aquinas was very respectful of Averroes, and he, oh, was, he, he was so excited about 
uh, he actually Thomas uh, was mentored by Albertus Magnus, and he, he believed that uh, enthused as he was with scholasticism, that in fact he could integrate all of the religions, mm. uh, as known the religions of the book Judaism, and and so it wasn't you know it. I just wanted to say that. Yeah. I, I appreciate that. He didn't hold that exclusivism, exclusivism no, of the not church. That the yeah, was that's not it. at all. He was very different and then got in trouble for it, actually. He was silenced at one point by the church. Yeah, well, I think the best sign of, of being on the right path was to get in trouble with the church. <clears throat> because it, uh, you know, it seems like all the original thinkers of that time um, it, were just by the nature of what was revealed to them uh, were at odds with church doctrine. But I appreciate that very much. Thank you. Um, okay, and then so this we have a comment here before I get a reader. Um, Jeremy says, uh, what a beautiful statement by Master Eckhart of uh, sub-selves in contemporary psychology regarding the subconscious mind hundreds of years before this psychological perspective emerged. Yes. Yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's so direct, isn't it? He's, he's just so clearly speaking truth, you know, uh, with this, um, with this quote. Um, yeah. Okay, so if, you know, ever the optimist, I'm going to try to go back into full screen mode here again after having quit a program. So if we could get a reader for okay. uh, this, please. And Veronica, can you read that for us, please? Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Yes? Yes. Okay. In ridiculing the geocentric system of astronomy, expounded by Claude Ptolemy, modern, ast modern astronomers have overlooked the philosophic key to the Platonic uh, system. The universe of Ptolemy, sorry, the universe of, uh, the universe of Ptolemy is a diagrammatic representation of the relationships existing between the various divine and elemental parts of every creature and is not concerned with astronomy as that sign is now com as that sign is now comprehended in the above figure special attention is called to the three circles of the zodiac surrounding the orbits of the planets these zodiacs represent the threefold spiritual constitution of the universe the orbits of the planets are the governors of the world and the four elemental spheres in the center represent the physical constitution of both man and the universe. Ptolemy's scheme of the universe is simply a cross-section of the universal aura, the planets and the elements to which he refers, having no relations to those recognized by modern astronomers. Thank you. Thoughts or questions about this? MPH's observations reveal the true purpose of this chart, which we discover is not a relic of Earth-centered astronomy, but rather a, quote, diagrammatic representation of the relationship existing between the various divine and elemental parts of every creature, particularly humankind, of course, including numinal sources or influences on our planet, Notice, for instance, the inclusion of the prime mover, an idea that stood at the core of Greek philosophy for a millennium and still informs theosophy. Okay, in the next couple of paragraphs, here shown grayed out, MPH guides us through a number of isms, which I've highlighted, most of them representing materialistic schools of thought, um, or minor offshoots of the major philosophies. The next bright esoteric light was uh, Baruch de Spinoza, one of the earliest thinkers in a philosophical movement called the Enlightenment. Could we get a reader for this 
please. Scott, can you read that for us, please? Yes. Baruch de Spinoza, the eminent Dutch philosopher, conceived God to be a substance absolutely self-existent and needing no other conception besides itself to render it complete and intelligible. The nature of this being was held by Spinoza to be comprehensible only through its attributes, which are extension and thought. These combine to form an endless variety of aspects or modes. The mind of man is one of the modes of infinite thought. The body of man is one of the modes of infinite extension. Through reason, man is enabled to elevate himself above the illusionary world of the senses and find eternal repose in perfect union with the divine essence. Spinoza, it has been said, deprived God of all personality, making deity synonymous with the universe. So any thoughts or questions about this paragraph? Uh, you couldn't come up with a philosophy like this with impunity. The Jewish religious authorities issued a harem against Spinoza, causing him to be expelled by Jewish society at age 23. You know, we normally think of uh, of the Catholic Church as, as being those who were so censorious, right? But it also extended to the synagogues. He was expelled even by his own family. And it wasn't long before his books were added to the Catholic Church's Index of Forbidden Books. By the way, if you're looking for a good read, 17th century read, this is probably a good place to start. If Spinoza had been living in Spain or Italy, he would almost certainly have become a victim of the Inquisition, the sixth ray at its worst, of which Helena Rorick wrote, the Inquisition was created to establish unrestrained rule over the poor, frightened population. The most effective means of achieving this was robbery and the annihilation of all who, those who aspired to bring light into the darkness of the Middle Ages. Those who were too independent, who dared to talk about the general good, who protested against this kingdom of the devil, personified in the representatives of the Inquisition. The establishment of the Inquisition was a horrible caricature of divine justice. This is why esoteric philosophy was largely silent, at least in Europe, during uh, the Middle Ages uh, until the Enlightenment. But even then, as in the case of Spinoza, the price of independent thought was very high. It was no accident that the philosophical works of both Descartes and Spinoza developed in the relatively free cultural and intellectual background of the Dutch Republic in the 17th century. In Spinoza's groundbreaking book, Ethics, we see the ageless wisdom finally begin to reemerge 1,200 years after Proclus, the last of the Neoplatonists. Now, in, uh, in Arabia, um, Avicenna was able to develop that because he was not in uh, direct conflict with the church. Uh, in his book, Ethics, Spinoza posits the idea that all existence is one reality, as we see in this quote. Whatsoever is, is in God, and without God, nothing can be or be conceived. Unquote. And that there is only one set of rules governing this unitive reality. Thus, Spinoza viewed God and nature as two facets of the same thing, a single fundamental substance, and by substance he means that which substands rather than matter, which is the basis of the universe akin to theosophy's sea of fire of which all lesser entities are modes or modifications. It's used by Spinoza, the term substance, as I mentioned, it means uh, that which stands beneath. Okay. Francis. You... Yeah. Uh, Scott's got his hand up. Go ahead, Scott. Yeah. Uh, I just want to go back to, to go back a couple pages to where you had the listing, keep going. 
that one. Um, I want to just give a, a sh that one a shout out to the Baconian, um, the inductive system of reasoning, which basically set the way of modern science, the rational thinking and the, the inquisitive method and, and of modern science. And remembering that we've been told that this Roger Bacon was the previous incarnation of Francis Bacon. So I don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater hill on that one. It's a very important system that he brought forth. Yeah. Not as esoteric, but in the, the way we're looking at it in the mystical sense, but certainly in an occult sense or a rational sense, it was extremely important. And yes, it's hard. Right. I'm glad you pointed that out. You know, this, uh, in some ways, the entire, in, in their quest to make philosophy a science, all of the school of enlightenment, because you got to remember these, you know, these weren't headed by a master of wisdom. For the most part, these, um, these philosophers, um, uh, through logic, came up with their own systems, right? And so it's it, it 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 had to be inductive inherently, you know. Um, that's the system by which you develop something, you know, uh, starting with the known and developing upwards, right? Um, the deductive system in is uh, you know in many ways depends upon the revelation of an avatar or a master of wisdom, so. Um, it's this rigor was very necessary, uh, especially during this time. It's amazing how many of the, what you'd call the, the ageless truths, how many they came up with who were able to into it. Um, I came to appreciate the more I studied them. So thanks for that, Scott. Sure. Back to, so I know now what's wrong. I have too many slides in this presentation. That's what's wrong. Um, I am going to have to divide them in future. Um, so let's see, we were here and then on to page 18 and a look at Leibniz, Leibniz, another philosopher of the Enlightenment. So could we get a, uh, I'll keep switching back and forth. I think it's easier to read if I go to full screen. Um, so uh, could we get a reader for this paragraph, please? Barbara, can you read that for us, please? Okay, I'm not hearing from her, so let's go to... Uh, Brennan, can you read that for us? You're self-muted. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, thank yeah. you. German philosophy had its inception with Gottfried Wilhelm von Liebenitz, whose theories are permeated with the qualities of optimism and idealism. Leibniz's criteria of sufficient reason revealed to him the insufficiency of De Socrates' theory of extension. Descartes. And he, yeah. and he therefore concluded that substance itself contained an inherent power in the form of an incalculable number of separate and all sufficient units. Matter reduced to the to its ultimate particles ceases to exist as a substantial body. Being resolved into a mass of immaterial ideas or metaphysical units of power to which Libanitz applied the term monad. Uh, that's where it came from. Thus, the universe is composed of an infinite number of separate monadic entities unfolding spontaneously through the objectification of active qualities. All things are conceived as consisting of single monads of varying magnitudes or of aggregations of these bodies, which may exist as physical, emotional, mental, or spiritual substances. God is the first and greatest monad. The spirit of man is an awakened monad in contradistinction to the lower kingdoms whose governing monadic powers are in a semi-dormant state. Thanks, Brennan. So any You're thoughts, welcome. questions about Leibniz's idea? 
So Leibniz invented calculus, as well as his stepped calculator shown at the top of this page. Though he shied away from writing anything that might put him at odds with the church, uh, which was, you know, uh, very necessary just to survive, right? Uh, his treatise on the monad was a significant contribution to esoteric philosophy. There's a page from it there at the bottom. Um, sufficient reason um, was Leibniz's theory of causality, which hypothesizes that all aspects of the objective world must have a subjective origin, aka a sufficient reason. You know, it's not like, well, you need a good reason for doing something. This was the uh, sufficient reason for being, the, you know, the subjective origin of being. At the heart of this subjectivity was the monad or irreducible essence. Importantly, Leibniz realized the ultimate immateriality or illusion of matter, correctly deducing that all nature is made up of, quote, metaphysical units of power, which he called monads. And DK calls atoms of substance when talking about the lesser lives and monads when describing humanity. It's not a direct crossover there in terms of Leibniz's use of the term monad and DK's use of it, but they, um, they're they definitely related. Furthermore, Leibniz intuited that existence is an externalization of what he called innate active qualities. So any thoughts or questions so far about any of these ideas? Okay. Up next, Immanuel Kant. Can we get a reader for this uh, paragraph? Kath Catherine, can you read that for us? You're self-muted. You're still self-muted. I. Okay, let's let's move on. Diana, can you read that for us, please? Okay. You can try Gabriella Martinez. Yeah. Gabrielle, can you read that for us, please? Okay. <laughs> Jessica, can you read that for us, please? How about if I read that for us, please? That sounds good. Though a product of the Leibniz Wolfian school, Immanuel Kant, like Locke, dedicated himself to investigation of the powers and limits of human understanding. The result was his critical philosophy, embracing the critique of pure reason, the critique of practical reason, and the critique of judgment. Dr. W. J. Durant sums up Kant's philosophy in the concise statement that he rescued mind from matter. The mind, Kant conceived to be the selector and coordinator of all perceptions, which in turn are the result of sensations grouping themselves around some external object. In the classification of sensations and ideas, the mind employs certain categories of sense, time and space, of understanding, quality, relation, modality, and causation. In the unity of apperception, the ability to assimilate an idea. Being subject to mathematical laws, time and space are considered absolute and sufficient basis for exact thinking. Kant's practical reason declared that while the nature of noumenon could never be comprehended by the reason, the fact of morality proves the existence of three necessary postulates, free will, immorality, and God. 
Make that immortality. Oh, I'm sorry. (laughs) Immortality in God. In their critique of judgment, uh, Kant demonstrates the union of the noumenon and the phenomenon in art and biological evolution. So any thoughts or questions? It's a very dense paragraph, but yes. we're going we're gonna to jump into it and uh, take a closer look. And first of all... Martha's got her hand up. Hold on a second. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, go ahead, Thank Martha. Yeah. Thank you. I, I just wanted to add that Kant was a big uh, influence on uh, uh, the person who began ethical culture called uh, Felix Adler, who was a student rabbi at the time. Um, huh? in Germany and but what came out of the a lot of and I have to compliment you um, on your presentation of such rich material it's opening I'm sure other people's floodgates as well but uh, Kant in fact influenced um, the spiritual um, segment of what's known as ethical humanism and mm-hmm. He opened a a lot of controversy, as so many of the um, humanists have have designated themselves as non-philosophical atheists. However, um, Kant um, indirectly, through the spiritual humanists, influenced the the American thought that John Dewey in, in education and Emerson Uh, So the strain of spirituality and spiritual, um, I I can't think of the better word than emanation from these Neoplatonists into this um, world of transcendentalism, which was quite distinct from traditional religion. Um, It's just significant. Some of these people that you're mentioning, Francis, are, <laughs> are opening up wellsprings of, of uh, imagination and are a wonderful presentation of history. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you, Martha. Yeah, it's interesting to uh, make that distinction between you know spiritual humanism uh, and what you'd call agnostic or atheistic humanism you know which really says enough of this nonsense let's turn to the human needs and what can make humans have a better life you know and uh people such as the philosophers Kant, you know recognize both sides and I, that goes all the way back to socrates you know who really focused on the human condition but had a deep spiritual awareness of uh, of the order of things, you know, spiritual, uh, and yet the focus was on um, right living and, and uh, alleviating suffering, etc. So, yeah, thank you, Martha. I I can tell that you have some uh, some deep background in this, um, so it's that's very useful, uh, folks. I am going to do a little bit of housekeeping here because I don't want to uh, just deal with um this blackout business so if you'll just uh bear with me here what i'm going to do is is um, create a yeah okay i'm going to create another file um for what we have been through up to this point i'm going to just move over to a new document, Uh, any document will do. And so starting here, going down to where we just were. And hopefully that will relieve the computing power. Back to this and delete it from here.
And that, <laughs> thank you for that. Now we should be able to go into this full screen mode without um, bogging down to where we yeah, happier. Okay, thank you for that. Um, so I want to let's take a closer look at this um, material on Kant. Um, here we go. The mind, Kant conceived to be the selector and coordinator of all perceptions, which in turn are the result in, of sensations grouping themselves about some external object. Said another way, the mind selects then coordinates its perceptions based on the sensations that have been stimulated by some external object. Then we have, in the classification of sensations and ideas, the mind employs certain categories of sense, time, and space, of understanding, quality, relation, modality, and causation and the unity of our perception, the ability to simulate an idea. This sentence describes how the mind classifies sensations and ideas. And this can't, oh my God, okay. It's just gonna be one of those days. Um, via MPH gives us three groups. Um, first, uh, represents the outer, the senses employed in time and space. The second group uh, represents meaning gained through perception, akin to the second principle in DK's teaching. The third, the third group represents the perceived causation plus the effect gained by adding this assimilated whole to one's existing awareness. So we have, first of all, uh, in perception, we have the environment of perception, which is time and space. That then creates understanding, quality, relation, modality. Um, from that, we gain a sense of what the cause may be. Uh, and then we add that to uh, our what we already have in an understanding of whatever we're looking at uh, to gain a, a synthetic whole. So we can see Kant really broke down this process of perception uh, to gain some understanding. Um, so uh, MPH's final statement on Kant posits the idea that the quote fact of morality proves um, the existence of free will, immortality, as opposed to immorality, and God. This is where Kant departs from the materialist lock, taking us all the way back to Socrates and his argument for and emphasis on moral living. Okay, any uh, final thoughts or questions on Kant? That's a little better anyway. Anyone? Okay. Let's go on to uh, MPH's brief statement on Johann Gottlieb Fichte. Can we get a reader for this small statement? Tia, can you read that for us, please? You're self muted. Yeah, I'm not seeing you. You're still self-muted. Okay, let's go on to Tiu. Tiu, can you read that for us, please? Yes, do you hear me? Yes. Yes. The philosophy of Johann Gottlieb Fichte was a projection of Kant's philosophy wherein he attempted to unite Kant's practical reason with his poor reason. Fichte held, held that the known is merely the contents of the consciousness of the knower and that nothing can exist 
to the knower until it becomes part of those contents. Nothing is actually real, therefore, except the fact of one's own mental experience. Thank you. Um, so Fitch's perspective is apparently inductive, right? Working from the known to into the unknown, uh, working from phenomenon to noumenon. But the fact that a belief in numeral reality cannot be arrived at through scientific inductive reasoning suggests that the philosophy of both Kant and Fichte allowed for a subjective exploration of consciousness. It was from this Aristotelian framework, uh, desire, the desire to make philosophy a, quote, true science, that Fichte says, nothing is actually real, therefore, except the facts of one's own mental experience. The effort to ground philosophy in mental experience was necessary and useful for the development of awareness of how the mind functions. But there is a difference between mental experience, which can be impressed by the intuition, and the so-called scientific method, which is bound to physical measurable phenomena. The philosophy of Kant and Fichte allowed for this, for this intuitive understanding Locke and the school he spawned did not. So whereas Spinoza espoused the unity of deity and substance and Leibniz the fact of the monad, Kant explored the nature of pure reason. In this exploration, he introduced the occult concept of a thing in itself, objects or ideas, as they are in truth, independent of our sensory assessment of them. Here's a statement from Kant's uh, Prolegomena. Um, can we get a reader for this, please? I think it's worth reading. Yes. Uh, okay. Uh, Martha, I'm trying to unmute you, but... Okay, let me try the... There we go. I got, I got it. Thank you. Um, uh, oh, actually, yeah. I was the other Martha, but another Martha. Hi, is this working? Oh, <laughs> yes. Oh, okay. And we indeed, rightly considering objects of sense as mere appearances, confess thereby that they are based upon a thing in itself, though we know not this thing as it is in itself, but only know its appearances. Bees vis a -vis, the way in which our senses are affected by this unknown something. Thank you. Okay, um, this is a fascinating idea that he's brought up, you know, this thing in itself. We normally think of, you know, the mystery of being as outside the form aspect altogether, but here he's, he's talking about, you know, even when we're considering a form, we're completely dependent on what our senses tell us about this thing, uh, which may or may not have anything to do with what he calls or coined the thing in itself. So it's, it's a very interesting concept. Um, so in my humble opinion, the closest approach to the ageless wisdom during the enlightenment came through the pen of Friedrich Wilhelm Joseph von Schelling. This is also when I began to realize that the longer your name is, the better chance you have of becoming a great philosopher. So uh, could we get a reader for this paragraph? Antonella, can you read that for us, please? Sure. Recognizing the necessity of certain objective realities Friedrich Wilhelm Joseph von Schelling, who succeeded Fichte in the chair of philosophy at Jena, first employed the doctrine of identity as the groundwork for a complete system of philosophy. Whereas Fichte regarded itself, uh, sorry, whereas Fichte regarded itself as the absolute, von Schelling conceived infinite and eternal mind 
to be the all-pervading cause. Realization of the Absolute is made possible by intellectual intuition, which, being a superior or spiritual sense, is able to dissociate itself from both subject and object. Von Schelling conceived Kant's categories of space and time to be positive and negative respecti respectively and material existence the result of the reciprocal action of these two expressions. Von Schelling also held that the absolute in its process of self-development proceeds according to a law or rhythm consisting of three movements. The first, a reflective movement, is the attempt of the infinite to embody itself in the finite. Finite, I don't know how to say. Finite. Finite, finite. The second, that of subsumption, is the attempt of the absolute to return to the infinite after involvement in the finite. The third, that of reason, is the neutral point wherein the two former movements are blended. Okay, any thoughts or questions? Let's look at a few of these statements. First, whereas Fichte, is that how you pronounce it, Antonella? Fichte? I don't know yes, whether. Yes, yeah, yes, because uh, in German you say, for example, von Schelling and Fichte, you say all the, uh, yes, also the last vocal. No, okay, good to know. Yeah. Uh, so whereas Fichte regarded yeah. as the absolute, von Schelling, conceived infinite and eternal mind to be the all-pervading cause. It seems to me that both Kat and von Schelling are right. Um, according to the Ageist wisdom, the self is ultimately one with the absolute. As to the second statement, the infinite and eternal mind being the all-pervading cause, we, we have to ask the cause of what? Existence? If so, yes pre-cosmic ideation manifests as the will to be, which characterizes the will aspect of the first logos. But according to the ageless wisdom, infinite and eternal mind is not the cause of beingness or isness, which substands all existence, including universal mind. So next up, Realization of the absolute is made possible by intellectual intuition, which being a superior or spiritual sense is able to dissociate itself from both subject and object. The last half of the sentence is correct. The intuition functions beyond the realm of the pairs of opposites, beyond subject-object duality. And, and in this, we're uh, using the definition of intuition as it comes to us through uh, Alice Bailey and I think uh, the concepts of pure reason that were espoused by the Enlightenment uh, philosophers uh, recognizes this level of the intuition. It's not a hunch, the intuition that is, right? It's, it's, a, it's a, a source of highest mind. So, however, Though the intuition breaks us free of the illusion, glamour, and maya of the lower quaternary, it isn't capable of unveiling the absolute, as suggested here, since the absolute stands beyond all conditioned awareness, even that of the highest Dhyani Chohans, and certainly beyond anything that could be uh, um, perceived by the intuition. A lot of this has to do with, you know, what did these philosophers mean by the absolute? You know, it could very well be that they they considered, you know, something like the highest uh, deity in incarnation, like our first logos as the absolute, rather than what is theosophically considered to be the absolute. Uh, you know, it's hard to know without really reading deep into their work just what they meant. Uh, Martha, maybe you could inform us on that. Um, uh, Martha G. 
on on that. I you know I didn't go deep enough to be able to unearth what was meant you know by no. them about no. the. Opposite. You know much more about von Schelling than than I do. I something uh, he must have been a true um, must have been a true voice because in church history, which is where I learned about some of these philosophers, very significant figures were dropped. <laughs> but what I what I'm wondering is that why this may be extremely uh, significant from the standpoint of the philosophical basis for Asia's wisdom is that what is being attributed when we talk about intellectual intuition it is something is being attributed to the human which has not been attributed before mm. and i and that I think what, if I can say back what I heard you say, Francis, is, is that in uh, in von Schelling that he taught that this was uh, able to dissociate itself from the subject and object. And I think you were indicating, maybe you can elaborate back on this, tossing the ball back to you, is that no, there's an, there is a relationship between subject and object that informs intellectual intuition in a, a, a we call the we call it direct reasoning, um, yeah. and that you're you're wanting us to hold on to the distinction here, so that we can appreciate um, the this um, subtle but significant distinction between what's considered emanating from or in, in the earlier part of this session, it seemed to me that the emanators had a, a kind of a, a hierarchy that was not the same as what Dickens mean that from greater to lesser, whereas mm -hmm. now we're getting to the place where intrinsic relationship is asserting a kind of equality for lack of a better word i hope i'm making sense but yeah i think a lot of this has its basis in the fact that all of these philosophers we've been looking at um, uh, leibniz kant uh now von schelling you know they're they're having to invent this from the ground up it's inductive and uh you know they made extraordinary headway and so they are exploring that region wherein subject object unites and they correctly in, <laughs> intuited that the intuition was the faculty you could say by which that common uh, commonality of the pairs and it, actually a coming philosopher really explored this very specifically um will be coming to uh, soon who is it that does this uh i think it's hegel who really poured his attention on this idea of of subject object um and thesis antithesis and how they met and how to understand that um that point of union right which is intuitive you know it's made available to one through the intuition so uh, um, yes michael Francis, yes, I couldn't resist. Okay. Oh, <laughs> I've been here all along. Well, you know, the joke has been made that uh, the Germany of that time owned the realm of the air. Well, you know, if we were studying the, uh, the formulas of Master Decay, it's pretty clear that the realm of the air is the Buddhic plane and that of the intuition. And it seems to me that these um, philosophers represent the fourth ray soul of mm -hmm. Germany, oh, which, had, which had been elevated quite a bit through their uh, understanding and the desire to reconcile uh, the pairs of opposites through the intuition. A very different thing from the blood and iron of the 19th century and Bismarck and Hitler and all of those people who were functioning on the first ray 
personality and just use the fourth ray for the sake of conflict. So somehow they were catapulted, uh, these philosophers, into uh, a realm which had been worked out, I think, very well by some Neoplatonists and some of the early Greek philosophers and certainly by the, uh, by the Buddha and the Vedantists. You know, they had different names for these things, yeah. but many of them, I think, were, you know, like reincarnated uh, aspects of those earlier uh, manifestations. So I just thought I'd point out a little bit of the uh, numerology behind it, that number four yeah. is so important when dealing with Germany in its higher uh, expression. Yeah, and of course, you know, the right up there in the list of attributes of the fourth ray is reconciling the pairs of opposites. It's built into the title, you know, um, uh, harmony through conflict. And the conflict, of course, occurs um, in that pairs of a pair of opposites. So it's not surprising, especially at a soul level, that they would be, uh, you know, fascinated and engaged by these concepts. Uh, yeah. And and Hegel really steps into it. We'll we'll get there uh, next. I believe he's, uh, coming yeah, up. he's coming up. I was really taken by uh, Fichte here, uh, how he felt that the infinite had to be rendered finite and then returned to the infinite. Uh, you know, I, I, I tell you, that that's my language. Uh, I, I've always felt that I had an incarnation as some kind of uh, German musician uh, in those early days uh, of the 18th, uh, of the 19th century. And it just felt like uh, kind of coming home to hear that kind of language from a philosopher who's deriving this uh, from his own understanding. <laughs> <That's perfect. laughs> yeah. Thank yeah. you, Mike. Yep. Okay. Um, so, Von Schelling's next statement takes us into, you know, what could be theosophical doctrine. He said, I'll read this because it's short enough. Von Schelling also held that the absolute in its process of self development proceeds according to a law of rhythm consisting of three movements. The first, a reflective movement, is the attempt of the infinite to embody itself in the finite, you know, uh, addressing uh, what Michael was just describing. The uh, second, it is von Schelling, but then not, not Fichte, I'm sorry, yeah, von Schelling. Yes. Not mm -hmm. Fichte, but it's the same concept. The second, that of subsumption, is the attempt of the absolute to return to the infinite after involvement in the finite. And here's a fascinating one. The third, that of reason, is the neutral point wherein the two former movements are blended. So any thoughts or questions about this? That is the 25th plane, uh, I believe. In other words, it's the middle, middlemost plane on the cosmic physical plane where pure reason is found and you know sometimes we say the buddhic plane represents intuition but in the way it's listed with master dk it's only the middlemost point of the buddhic plane which represents the pure reason or intuition the fourth subplane so right right in the very center the fourth subplane of the buddhic plane with about equal below as equal above that's fascinating wow yeah so first referencing hold, the statement yeah hold, hold go ahead a um scott did you want to say something i would say only what i was going to say what michael said more oh. or less so it's been covered okay. okay thanks scott uh it's good to know we're all on the same page here uh, so let's go back through some of these ideas first referencing the statement and on the left what you're going to see is you know a series of pictures of von schelling um as he ages and on the right it's just a repeat of this um what we just read so first referencing the statement the absolute in its process of self-development uh now that should send up a red flag for some of us um according to the ageless wisdom the absolute does not quote self-develop for there is nothing in pure beingness to develop. Only attributes such as consciousness can be developed. 
perhaps von Schelling's understanding of the absolute was more in line with what the Ageless Wisdom describes as the first logos. If so, the rest of von Schelling's statement becomes true in this context and even deeply insightful, insightful for the three movements cited govern every cycle of the law of periodicity. Through the evolutional phase of the will to be, deity clothes itself in form. Through the evolutional phase of return, that which was imprisoned by the form aspect progressively rediscovers its true self, its origins in deity. The so-called third movement, I mean, this is, you know, pretty much straight theosophy, right? This is the movement that's, that's interesting, the so-called third movement described here actually unfolds in the consciousness of, as I understand it, of the pilgrim on the path of return. Enlightenment era philosophers divided reason into two categories, practical and pure reason. Uh, as I was able to understand it, practical reason is animated by intelligence, pure reason by the intuition. This is also in line with uh, DK or theosophical understanding. Placing the involution evolution apogee at the point where pure reason is developed is an interesting idea since it is through the intuition that we build the antikarana which allows us to move from the form to the spirit aspect. So, and it's in, in, Michael just added to that concept, you know, this, this point where the, um, the evolution, evolution apogee um, comes to a rest and moves in the other direction may very well be what Michael pointed out was the 25th subplane right in the middle of the cosmic physical plane and that would make sense you know from the point of view of just the math of it for it to shift from form biased to spirit biased right just you know that which is below the 25th and that which lies above it um anyway it's an interesting idea since it's through the intuition that we build the antikorana right um Okay, any thoughts about any of this? Anything von Schelling? Yes. Go ahead, Antonella. Yes, um, I was reminded that um, a picture that uh, where there are the first emanation, the second emanation, the third emanation, and uh, saying that the point of union for the human soul is the monastic plane or the mental plane but uh, for a uh, higher consciousness like uh, initiates for example or fourth degree uh, we can say that the neutral point is on the buddhic plane and for high ever higher initiates the point of union of the two movements, first um, and the second movement, are on the atomic plane. So I mean, this, this neutral yeah. point is really shifting depending mm -hmm. on the point of evolution. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, it, it's probably more correct to say, you know, that rather than trying to come up with some static neutral point that is true for everyone, which we know is not the case, you know, uh, that it is ever moving based on our our degree of consciousness, our level of attainment. That's really good. Uh, thanks, Antonella. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we've read that, you know, for instance, the master of wisdom is work working very much in on atmic levels, um, attaining atmic consciousness. And of course, much yeah. more than that. But, you know, just if you were going to summarize. Yeah, and uh, the 25th in any case stays as a symbol as the middle point yeah. uh, because it's the middle point of the 49th subplane. So, yeah, it's the middle of the middle, right? Yeah, <laughs> the center of the center. The middle of, the, of the, each of the subplanes uh, is very significant. I mean, you know, mm. on the, it's the fourth. It's the fourth ether, ether on the physical plane that takes us out of, you know, visible physicality. It's the fourth subplane of the mental that 
where on we stand in meditation to reach into uh, the higher mental plane, the realm of the soul, with you know, we first have an experience of soul. And so it only stands the reason that, that the uh, mental subplane of the mental plane hmm. of the cosmic physical would be particularly significant. Um, I've had no uh, memorable experience there myself, but um, you know, I've heard it's a great place. Um, thanks, Anne. Sure. Okay. Any more comments about Von Schelling? Okay. Next up, the much more famous and influential George Wilhelm Frederick Hegel, who broke new ground in the development of the concept of log logic. And again, we know he was destined to be a great philosopher just by the length of his name. With Hegel, we move from the philosophic school of enlightenment to the German idealists. Uh, can we get a reader for this paragraph on Hegel? Kay, can you read that for us, please? You're self-muted. <laughs> can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Oh, right. Okay. George Wilhelm Frederick Hegel considered the intellectual intuition of von Schelling to be philosophically unsound and hence turned his attention to the establishment of a system of philosophy based on pure logic. Of Hegel, it has been said that he began with nothing and showed with logical precision how everything had proceeded from it nothing in brackets, in logical order. Hegel elevated logic to a position of supreme importance. In fact, as a quality of the absolute itself, God, he conceived, to be a process of unfolding which never attains to the condition of unfoldment. In like manner, though it is without either beginning or end. Hegel further believed that all things owe their existence to their opposites and that all opposites are actually identical. Thus, the only existence is the relationship of opposites to each other. Through those combinations, new elements are produced. As the divine mind is an eternal process of thought never accomplished, Hegel assails the very foundation of theism and his philosophy limits immortality to the ever flowing deity alone. Evolution is consequently the never ending flow of divine consciousness out of itself. All creation, though continually moving, never arrives at any state other than that of ceaseless flow. Thanks, Kay. So, yeah, I love this. Um, uh, a process of unfolding which never attains to the condition of unfoldment. That's a true philosophical statement, right? Um, any thoughts or questions about this paragraph? Before we can gain much from Hegel's ideas, we, we really have to consider what he means by the term logic, which he developed in his book, Science of Logic. Hegel, the most well-known of the German idealists, considered logic to be a way of developing through dialectics an idea or thesis and its opposite or antithesis in such a way that a synthesis was achieved through a process that he called sublation, which both unites, and here's the important word, and transcends the lower duality. Sounds to me like a preparatory thesis for the dissolution of glamour and illusion, you know, which is 
where DK tells us the pairs of opposites um, have their existence, right? Um, so let's take a look at a couple of Hegel's ideas. Yeah, we have to remember these are Hegel's ideas as interpreted by uh, uh, Manley Hall, right? Um, he says, Hegel elevated logic to a position of supreme importance, in fact, as a quality of the absolute in itself. Well, here we are again, right? In theosophy, the absolute stands beyond all functionality, including any kind of logical process. Nonetheless, the statement suggests that Hegel's logic represents the organizational means by which manifestation unfolds, the functionality you could say of universal mind, you know, at least at the highest levels of logic, we could see it as the the very functionality of the universal mind. But you know, what are called you know laws of the universe um, would express themselves through this kind of logic, right? So often we have to redefine these phrases at a higher level. But you know, if you've read DK, you're used to that. Um, next, we have God, he conceived to be a process of unfolding, which never attained the condition of unfoldment. That's probably my favorite line. In like manner, thought is without either beginning or end. With just a slight adjustment to this statement, we have one of the most important tenets of the age of wisdom, which might be stated thusly. The influence of deity initiates a ceaseless process of becoming that lasts until the dissolution of manifestation. In like manner, all thought can be seen as an unconscious attempt, conscious for the initiate, to become one with the idea that originally inspired that thought. Any thoughts or questions about this thought? About thought? Okay. The last two sentences support the first. Hegel assails the very foundation of theism and his philosophy, philosophy limits immortality to the ever-flowing deity alone. Evolution is consequently the never-ending flow of divine consciousness out of itself. All creation, though continually moving, never arrives at any state other than that of ceaseless flow. So Hegel recognized no difference between deity and what we might call the path of becoming. Uh, the only difference between the ageless wisdom and Hegel on this matter, at least as far as I can tell, is the question of the nature of entity and identity, which at least according to MPH, and it's hard to say unless you, you know, really read deeply into Hegel, which I haven't, uh, seems to have discounted. He believed that the process of becoming is itself deity, an idea that, though not in strict accord with, you know, uh, the ageless wisdom that I've read, nonetheless, in my humble opinion, helped to move the thinkers of the time a lot closer to the truth than the then pervasive concept of God as a static singularity. Any thoughts or questions about this? You could see why these guys got in trouble with the church, right? Um, you know, because basically he's saying there is no entity that is God. Um, that's not going to fly, uh, not without repercussions. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts about Hegel? Yes, Michael. I have a little here, not so much on Hegel, uh, but on something that he said uh god he conceived to be a process of unfolding which never attains to the condition of unfoldment now by unfoldment i presume he means the development of a periodical universe in time and space at least we would maybe we would say that <clears throat> from the theosophical perspective of the ageless wisdom and so i've al always thought now look You've got a universe. Universes occur in, apparently, according to the great breath, in an infinite sequence uh, of alternation. 
each one being uh, distinct, but each one being bounded as well. And thus every universe becomes uh, in its unfoldment exiled from absolute infinitude and every universe becomes a singularity. So basically you've got this um, proportion or yeah, I guess, uh, yeah, maybe a proportion of absolute infinity to one yeah. every time a universe appears. And under that mathematical, what would you say? It's a, it's a, it's, it's a ratio. It's a ratio. Yeah. yeah. You, you cannot, <laughs> you can never attain to the complete unfoldment of absolute infinitude. Now, now, uh, and now what I'm going to say about God here is that absolute infinitude is God's self-reflection. Mm -hmm. there, therefore, in fact, uh, this, this, this uh, super universal God, or whatever you want to call it, absolute deity, not quite the absolute, but something, uh, is absolutely infinite, just like Spinoza said, you know, and you can never objectify it. You can never um, unfold it in isolation, in time and space, uh, ever. And that has been forever. So, uh, you know, I, I, I certainly acquiesce to what he's saying there. How he arrived at this, you know, I don't know what his method was. Uh, but, but anyway, it seems like a correct uh, statement to me. Hmm. Yeah, I, uh, I concur, especially based on your explanation just then. You can see this, um, you know, the sentence that's in um, bold here, God, he can see to be a process of unfolding, which never changed the condition of unfoldment. It's, it's interesting because you can look at that both involutional as you just approached it, you know, which is um, that reflected God then um, um, becomes in increasingly uh, diversified, you could say. Uh, it moves from a state of, of absolute homogeneity uh, into the specific, the realm of the specific, right? Mm -hmm. But you can also look at this as, uh, an, as an evolutional process that um, in that unfolding towards becoming, which is, you could say, uh, gaining in, in increasing the circumference of your ring past knot, that you also never uh, attain absolute unfoldment. So it's interesting to look at it from the perspective of yeah, both. No, no, no division can ever attain in and of itself uh, absolute unfoldment. As a matter of fact, probably if we looked into that, that form of words, we would maybe find some kind of reason why uh, it didn't apply to absoluteness. But, but anyway, you know, I don't, I don't want to take it too much into this old Eastern method of thought, but I do notice one thing here, that he talks about God as a process, and I believe the word identity should also be attached to that word process. Because if you, if you evade identity then you do not have the, the, I, the sameness of any product of God with God. Yeah. So, in other, you know what I'm saying? We need, to, we need to have the identity of being God and not just reserve it for some kind of process which leaves the emanations out of it. Yeah. You know, so obviously all philosophers have a critique of every other philosopher, you know, according to the way their mind is shaped. So, you know, that's just, that's just my little uh, contribution here. You know, he was a, a great individual and obviously, a, again, uh, a, a representation of the fourth ray of Germany, mm -hmm. along with some very, very heavy third ray. <laughs> and you're going to even see by his face, actually. Anyway, that's another matter. But yeah. Uh, yeah, just thank you, uh, Francis. Well, thank you, Michael. And yeah. Scott. Uh, yeah, Scott. 
Great. I was just going to say, um, what what this reminds me of, it takes me back to Heraclitus, the ancient oh. Greek philosopher, whose main line, as far as I know, is simply that motion, all is motion, motion is. Mm -hmm. And that's what Hegel is saying here, what we're talking about, it just continues. There's no finish point here, it just continues. Motion yeah. is. Motion is, and it's, you know, it's one of the tenets of, of HPV's um, manifested absolute, which is that attribute of motion, right? Mm -hmm. Which is, you could call becoming, or, you know, um, in both involutional and evolutional uh, directions, right? So, yeah, yeah, it's the great breath, you know. Um, yeah, if, 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 uh... Heraclitus wrote anything more than that one line, and I suppose he did or said something about it. He might well have said this. Uh -huh. this thing. Yeah, it makes me want to go check him out. You know, we're, we're sort of artificially bound by the philosophers that MPH is bringing up in this introduction. Otherwise, we'd be here for two or three years. Um, but, uh, you know, because he didn't single out Heraclitus, but now I'm interested in the like to go see. Um, that, uh, what said about that. I'm glad you threw in the word manifested, absolute, you see, because basically you have a boundless immutable principle, which is the closest HPB comes to describing what absolute is. But if you look at the word boundless immutable, what you find is that division is impossible in any real sense. And without division, you don't have variety, you don't have number, you don't have multiplicity, uh, and you don't have movement, the possibility of movement because it's all relative, one thing moving against another. So the way I've tried to solve this is to say that a perception that, uh, that God, uh, has of itself, let's call it this, the super universal deity, I call it that anyway, is either as a homogeneous sameness or an infinitely diverse, absolutely infinitely diverse multiplicity. And both are legitimate self perceptions of God, of mm -hmm. itself. And beyond that, beyond that, uh, and I think I'm according with you what you what you said here, Francis, earlier, uh, no perception at all, no nothing at all in the no thing, no need for it, no articulation in the no thing, no division in the no thing, no relativity or interaction in the no thing. And you can't even use a word like in. You can't even use that, you know. So anyway, yeah. uh, uh, you know, the, I, I believe that the absolute deity which becomes countless universes, uh, is in fact absolutely infinite in its nature, but can never catch up with itself, so to speak, and on we go forever as forever. Anyway, you know, I'll just I'll just be quiet after that. But that's, <laughs> that's kind of my perception well, the, of it. You know, the first two stands <laughs> of the stands of Zahn were just full of negatives. You know, they're trying to, it's trying to describe the absolute in those first two stanzas. I, I think many of you uh, who are with us today, uh, you know, have been with the Secret Doctrine webinars. And what if you haven't, what I'm talking about is the stanzas of Don as presented in the Secret Doctrine. Anyway, the first two stanzas attempt to deal uh, with the absolute, which when you're attempting to do it in English is, you know, you're sure to fail. And the only way they could even attempt to do it was by using negatives it's not this it's not that it's not this and because anytime you make a positive statement about it you've circumscribed it to that statement you know and yeah. you're immediately in error you know when you're talking about the absolute so in some ways it was a great relief when we finally got to stanza three and we could actually have something happen because that's <laughs> 
That's the only thing, you know, us as, as mere mortals can understand is when things happen, right? So it, it has been, a, it, interestingly, a kind of relief to, you know, be introduced to, the, you know, the refulgent glory of Oya'o, who the younger, you know. <laughs> I think um, I, never got, I never got beyond sentence number one, and my whole life is wrestling with that one. That's it. The eternal parent in her, you know, ever invisible robe slumbering for seven eternities. I don't think I've moved beyond that point. <laughs> yeah. Well, it just, it just shows an, a, a very intense discrimination on your part because, it, you know, it's, it's a, it's, it's what um, uh, Don Juan called controlled folly, which I love the term because they're, they're kind of an oxymoron, right? The controlled folly, which is mm. that, what we're about to do is impossible to do. So let's go on with it, right? Let's get on with it. And then you write the stanzas of Zan, you know, uh, because it's it's truly, it, it's it's a fool's errand to try to make this thing comprehensible. Uh, and yet something is gained in the attempt, um, which is, you know, why we do this, right? And it's just, a, this, yeah, I, what I call it, the final quest in self-understanding. I think that's really what we're embarked upon because after all, what is the self? So anyway, you know. It is. Know thyself, you know, know thyself. Yeah, and that just reaches, you know, that's the evolutionary open door, you could mm. say, you know, because mm. it just, it stretches all the way to the absolute. Mm. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, thanks so much for this insight into Hegel, uh, Michael. I, I appreciate that. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and Martha has yeah. her hand up and she's yeah. self-muted. So there you go, Martha. I uh, hope I'm not taking this uh, away from the higher thinking that you did, but Hegel is truly pivotal in a lot of thinking because basically his theory of negation as i understood it also spawned an, a tremendous amount of thinking in terms of what diversity was and diversification and out of hegel actually um it was he, he was that millennial um, thinker that led actually led to even Freud beginning to talk about the subjective and the unconscious. But what I wanted to draw a line for was in the future, from Hegel to Alfred North Whitehead in his process uh -huh. theology. And I know that I, I'll just drop the name and, and let it go at that. But the um, I'm blown away by DK's timing in terms of picking in the early 20th century, an English um, entity through which his work could flow. Because in fact, um, I don't happen to think that what he had to offer humanity could have been fully appreciated had there not been the incursions after Hegel that challenged mm. his system to find the rhythm, find the flow between the absolute and the diverse. Mm -hmm. so I just to point that out. That's very, very interesting. You know, I would, I, you know, I'd love to uh, just set the webinar aside here and have a little discussion about uh, this concept of negation in Hegel. I'm not versed enough to to know just what that means uh, it'd be interesting could you say just a couple of lines about that well well i and i'm not an authority on hegel either but when hegel was developing his theory his dialectical theory neg negativity his theory of negation was very positive it was very energetic it was it was not to diminish, but what he couldn't seem to get himself he, he you know he went to synthesis he went the positive the negative and then the third element was synthesis, and um, 
I think in some ways, some of him, he, he cornered himself a little bit in, in terms of he couldn't reconcile other than to create these dialectics of synthesis. Um, because he, his contribution was actually, how can I put it? I believe that what he was attempting to do was to try to insert, infuse in the discussions about what God was was a different element of energy than the absolute. And he, he knew one didn't, you know, that one didn't exist without the other. Unity, the absolute cannot be appreciated except in the field of diversity, because it, it, it is some of the earlier philosophers said, you said it, Francis, in the discussion of how do you create motion? Motion is that which something flows from one thing to another in, in, you know, in some sort of a unified kind of theory. So he, uh, he didn't achieve it in my mind, but he got, he spawned a tremendous amount of, of questioning and different, and uh, that ended up in creating more integral theories of understanding. And it was in when that Theories of understanding began to integrate evolution, mathematics. Uh, Bertrand Russell worked with Alfred North Whitehead. That 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 the, the level of complexity took on a different um, tone from the time of Hegel. If uh -huh. that's what I was just trying to say. Yeah, yeah. You, the idea that Hegel really was a millennial pivoting point you know that led to thinkers like whitehead you know i i think that if uh, manly hall had lived had written this a little later that whitehead would have been uh, a part of this lexicon you know because he was so such an important uh thinker um thanks for that uh, francis, you know, francis yeah. can i just say one more thing okay. some of the greatest some of the greatest i don't know what to call them um Indianologists, people who who studied the subcontinent of India, showed up in Germany. Mm. And, I, and I just want to say that their rays are the same except reversed. The first uh -huh. and the fourth ray, yeah. and the fourth and the first ray, and they both have the Aries soul, which mm. seeks for the principle of the one. So I think you see a transplant going on here uh, in the later German idealists uh, from the early Brahmanical and Vedantic uh, conceptions. Thank That's you. a fascinating observation. I, I love that. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> thanks, Michael. Yep, yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah, there's this wonderful cross-pollination that you can explore when you look at the soul and personality rays of different countries. And as Michael was pointing out, uh, Germany and, and India are just the opposite, but in that opposition, you have the deep connection. With, and what that means is that Germany has a fourth ray soul, India has a first ray soul. Germany has a, a first ray personality, India a fourth ray personality. So um, uh, it's a, it's a, it's almost like the, the um, it's almost like astrological axes, you know, which DK tells us um, are really the same energy. Uh, if you remember that section in uh, Gemini where he describes these six axes, which Gemini rules, um, that make up the 12 signs and that these axes really are the same energy uh, expressing themselves in opposition, right? Uh, so you have something similar when you have this kind of ray configuration of the countries being opposite like that. Um, that's that's interesting. Your idea that this um, uh, that the Indians would then be transplanted into the uh, uh, idealist German in school. Mm -hmm. You know, being really fascinated by the same uh, concepts. Uh, but from a European point of view, rather than, you know, the just that downflow of divine awareness that comes as a result of uh, 
of the overshadowing masters of, you know, beings like the master Jupiter, you know, they don't have to like try to figure out what's going on. They're there, you know, and incarnate. So it's yeah. a different situation. Yeah. And the, and the identicality of the Aries soul in both cases, that really stands for something. It's not opposites in that case. It's, it's identical. It's identical. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Okay. Um, anyone else on this uh, very second subject before we move on? Okay. Uh, we're going to skip Herbart, speaking of first ray, to take a look at the aggressively first ray philosophy of Arthur Schopenhauer. Uh, can we get a reader for this paragraph. Okay. Laura, can you read that for us, please? All right. Oh, go ahead. Hello. Hello, go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, if you could speak up or move closer to your mic. I'll try. Uh, can you hear me better now? That's better, yes. Okay, thank you. So, the true subject of Arthur Schopenhauer's philosophy is the will. The object of his philosophy is the elevation of the mind to the point where it is capable of controlling the will. Schopenhauer likens the will to a strong blind man who carries on his shoulders the intellect, which is a weak, lame man possessing the power of sight. The will is the tireless cause of manifestation and every part of nature the product of will. The brain is the product of the will to know, the hand the product of the will to grasp. The entire intellectual and emotional constitutions of man are subservient to the will and are largely concerned with the effort to justify the dictates of the will. Thus, the mind creates elaborate system excuse me, of thought simply to prove the necessity of the thing willed. Genius, however, represents the state wherein the intellect has gained supremacy over the will and the life is ruled by reason and not by impulse. So, you know, speaking of rage, you could see a strong, uh, that strong connection that inherently exists between the first and the fifth ray, you know, this, <laughs> I just love it. You know, the, the strong blind man carrying this uh, weak uh, intellect on its shoulders, you know, that's real first fifth ray connection there. Um, so DK tells us there are no pure first ray types. He didn't say there were no first ray philosophers. And if, if anybody, um, you know, uh, if we say of anyone, any philosopher that he's first read would be Schopenhauer. What we're not told here in this paragraph is at what level of expression uh, of the will Schopenhauer was championing. Was it mere personality willpower or was he responding to something and teaching something higher? Um, the dictates of first rate soul perhaps, or even the touch of his monad, which is inherently um of of the will aspect any thoughts about this before we move on okay moving on to page 19 we'll take a look at the extremely controversial doctrine of friedrich wilhelm nietzsche right could we get a reader for this section please Karen, can you read that for us, please? Sure. Nietzsche believes the purpose of existence to be the production of a type of all-powerful individual designated by him the superman. This superman was the product of careful culturing, for if not separated forc forcibly from the mass and consecrated to the production of power, the individual would sink back to the level of deadly mediocre. Love, Nietzsche said, 
should be sacrificed to the production of the Superman, and those only should marry who are best fitted to produce this outstanding type. Well, any red flags going up out there? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, any thoughts or questions about this? Obviously, the concept of the Superman was one of the steed thoughts that, that fueled the rise of Nazism. But like so many other concepts adopted by the Nazis, only to be degraded to their materialistic shadows, the idea of the Superman has its basis in truth, as indicated by MPH's concluding statement on Nietzsche. To those who understand the true meaning of power to be virtue, self-control and truth, the ideality behind Nietzsche's theory is apparent. To the superficial, however, it is a philosophy heartless and calculating, concerned solely with the survival of the fittest. It all depends at what level the theory is applied. D.K. wrote actually extensively on the subject of the Superman. Here's a selection from Esoteric Psychology, Volume 1. Could we get a reader for this? Carrie, can you read that for us, please? Yet the ideal of a Superman is a true ideal, and it needs upholding before the world. Temporarily, it has been forgotten that the Superman is the goal for all and that Asiatics, Nordics, Jews, Gentiles, Americans, and Anglo-Saxons, the Africans, and all other world races are children of the same father, fed from the same source of life, and saved by the same divine Christ principle. Therefore, the Superman has been and will be found emerging out of the ranks of every people to find his way into the ranks of the spiritual hierarchy and the new group of world servants. Germany has caught a vision of this ideal. It has as yet misinterpreting it, but Germany can give us the pattern of the Superman, and this is its ultimate destiny. Thank you, Carrie. And you have to, you know, just to give some sense of the vision incorporated in this writing, that this was written, you know, um, after uh, the Nazis had taken power you know, and before the end of World War II. So the shadow side um, was uh, very much being expressed, that first-rate personality. Um, well, it's uh, time, folks. Uh, we're at the end of our time, and we'll leave it with this uplifting quote. Um, it's a real pleasure to host these webinars. Uh, I've enjoyed this one in particular. Thank you all for participating. Um, the next webinar will either take us to the end of this um, philosophic survey that makes up the introduction um, or uh, beyond it. I'm thinking probably not the latter, um, but hopefully we can finish up the introduction next time. Um, and uh, so until then, uh, thanks very much for joining us today and we'll see you next time okay I want to I want to let everyone know the next one of these the secret teaching of all ages is one December and next week we have an early secret doctrine webinar um, on Sunday the 10th so hope to see yeah, you guys from, yeah just a week from now so you know tune in next Sunday Sunday if you're following both uh and then did you say first of december uh yes the first of december for uh stoa secret teaching of all ages good okay until then then good night good morning goodbye everybody